Hi, everybody. Welcome to Revolve U's keynote today. I'm Danielle Prescott. I am the style director at BET.com, and I am joined by Lindsay Peoples Wagner, who is, you guys probably know her. She is the editor in chief of Teen Vogue currently. Um, but that is not all she is. So, we are going to get into a very, very, very good discussion today. Um, and Lindsay, I want to just kick it off by asking, you know, you are the editor-in-chief and you are the youngest editor-in-chief in Connie Nast history, but do you ever feel limited because the first thing people always want to talk to you about is work? Um, you know, honestly, usually the thing that people love to bring in is the age thing, with, which still bothers me. Okay. Um, but it's fine. It's not anything I can change. I think that, you know, the work that we've done at Teen Vogue is really important and is constantly part of the conversation. So I don't get tired of people asking that. I think I more so get tired of people asking me, you know, or, or doubting me or questioning my capabilities because of how old I am. Yeah, that's really frustrating. Um, I mean, it almost benefits you to be a younger person um, at the head of a teen magazine. But like, do you feel that, um, you know, in some of the rooms you're in or some discussions you have, your age becomes a limiting factor into people respecting your authority? A hundred percent. I think a lot of times it's the same thing that honestly, you know, I think a lot of media companies want to, you know, praise Greta now, but like when Greta was, you know, first really came out on the scene and I think was doing so many amazing things and talking about climate change constantly, people didn't take her seriously and they really blew her off as like this young kid who didn't know what she was talking about. And I think that it is just a societal norm, unfortunately, that a lot of times when you are younger, I think it takes a longer time for people in the industry, whatever industry you're in, to really take you seriously. And I think um, I've always felt like, you know, it is, it's such a positive, but also can, can be a little bit annoying to be that executive who isn't 30 yet, but really be taken seriously. And I think I have just really tried to walk in confidence of that and also just make sure to spin it whenever, you, when anyone does say anything to me about it, um, to use that as a positive instead of making it seem like a negative thing. Absolutely. Do you ever wish there is, is there ever something that you wish people asked you more about? I think an interesting thing that people never ask me about is the feeling of what it is to be a leader. I think a lot of people ask me like, well, what is it like to be a boss and a leader and a manager and all these things? And like, what is your schedule like? And that that is, I mean, I totally get it. It is interesting in that retrospect, but I think honestly, what people don't realize is a lot of times in positions like this, um, it can be very isolating. It can be very lonely. And I think talking about the feeling of what it actually is at the end of the day and how you feel as a person and not just like what you're doing day to day um, should definitely be more of the conversation. I mean, it is, it is a lot and it is definitely emotionally also just exhausting to manage a lot of different things. And so mm -hmm. I think I wish that people would understand that part more so instead of just like, how productive are you? Right, absolutely. And I also think that working in media, there is a part of it that gets so glamorized that people just want to hear about that part. And you almost forget that you do have people reporting to you. You do have to make really difficult decisions about who gets hired, who gets fired, who is granted raises, like all of these things matter you know, to how you're, you're dictating what the work environment is like. And like, when no one's asking about that part of it, it can be really frustrating. Yeah, hundred percent. Do I you think feel like there's anything that people misunderstand about your position? I think a lot of times, you know, fashion is a hundred percent a competitive industry. I think everyone is always trying to like, you know, up another brand or get more traffic and all of those things. But I think honestly, the thing that I love about my job is that I'm never really thinking, you know, in, in competition of other publications, I'm really always, what can we bring to this moment that feels like us? And that honestly, a lot of that thinking came from when I worked at the Cut in New York Magazine, because I felt like one of the biggest lessons there that I learned was, you know, everybody can be talking about the story, but there's only one cut way to, to cover the story. And there's only one Teen Vogue way to cover the story. And so I really am always spending a lot of time thinking about that. And I think a lot of times when people ask me about, you know, how our approach is, et cetera. I think it also is just very 
indicative of the kind of person I am. Um, I remember reading Teen Vogue when I was younger and, you know, from going to intern and assistant at the brand, it very much felt like if you're a fashion person, these are the things that you care about in this box. And yeah. the big thing for me is people not understanding that like we're multifaceted human beings. You can be a fashion person, but also talk about the election all day long. AKA Lindsay. Um, so I think that for me, that is the biggest thing because we all care about a lot of different things. And I think that's my my biggest goal with Teen Vogue is obviously to make young people feel seen and heard and, and amplify their voices, but just to have culturally relevant conversations in general. Do you feel like you translate that over to your personal brand as well? Because I feel like social media gives us as editors so much more of an opportunity to talk about the things that matter to us um, yeah. because what people don't understand necessarily about like when you work at a publication is that you know even if you're overseeing content it might not be your name on that article or you might not be your name on that page so there it, it does get kind of lost to what the public sees but um how do you handle you know your personal brand Honestly, I just don't take myself that seriously. <laughs> um, I think when you think about it too much and when you're so focused on only posting the right pictures or right moments, et cetera, it's just dangerous territory that I don't want to get into. I honestly am like, I think it's such a it's such a bad cycle because I think you can start to think, oh, well, when I posted this, you know, I got a certain amount of likes and I'll, you know, I'll look at a lot of things of different influencers say, you know, oh, when I post pictures of me half naked, I get a lot more likes and follows. And then when I post pictures, you know, wearing something that's a little bit more covered up, there's no engagement, et cetera. And I, I just think that you have to do what's best for you. Like I'm, I have no interest in fame. Honestly, what I'm focused on is like fruitfulness and like doing things with intention. So I post a lot of just random things and I really don't. It's like, I want to post what we're working on. I'll post a picture of myself every now and then of like just things that I'm doing so people can get to know me on a different level, but I never want to take myself too serious. Um, and I don't want to take social media too seriously. Like obviously it is a business and you can make money off of and all those things. But I think when you start to, to give it more weight than like how you actually feel in your real life and what actually is going on, things start to get very muddy. Totally. I was on a panel a few weeks ago and there were a lot of career influencers on it and they were saying exactly what you said that they look at you know their engagement levels and they understand what their audience likes and they give them that and I didn't I had you know a similar response to you where I was like oh I definitely don't do that at all but I also feel a freedom in that you know when you work for somewhere that has millions of followers I'm like I'm serving that audience I don't really need to serve my personal audience. Yeah. Um, okay. To that end, will you tell us a little bit about your career journey and what led you to become the editor in chief of Team Bo? Yeah. I mean, I uh, grew up in Wisconsin and I grew up really liking fashion, but not really knowing what I wanted to do. Um, I spent a lot of time watching The Hills and Girlfriends and Cycle <laughs> City growing up. Um, <laughs> And it just felt really interesting. I didn't really think or connect the dots that I could do anything like that myself. Um, and so I ended up going to a small art school in Iowa and one of my professors saw a Teen Vogue posting for an internship. And so that's really how I ended up at Teen Vogue. Um, you know, interned a lot of other places. I tried PR, I tried styling. I think it's good to just try all the areas because you never really know what you what area is really best for your personality. Um, and then I ended up getting a job at Teen Vogue straight out of school um, and worked there for a couple of years. Um, then I went to style.com, which is now merged into Vogue.com. And that was a really pivotal point for me because that was when I really started to write a lot and I think um, just shaped my voice and tone of like what I wanted to do because when you're just an assistant, you're kind of just doing obviously the schlepping and organizing and all of that. And I hadn't really taken the time to figure out like what I wanted my viewpoint to be. Um, and then after that, I worked at The Cut in New York Magazine for about five years. And um, I wrote a piece when I was there called, you know, Everywhere, Nowhere, What It's Like to Be Black in Fashion. Um, and that was a really, there were so many different pivotal points at The Cut in New York Magazine of different things that I really was excited about to, to kind of flex the muscles that I knew that I had. Um, and then pretty much soon after I started this job. So it's, it's been a good ride so far. Yeah, amazing. Um, side note, are you still registered to vote in Wisconsin? 
Uh, no, I'm registered here. <laughs> Are you thinking about switching it? I mean, I thought about it and honestly, I was like, uh, I just don't, I honestly was only worried about it because I heard other people did that before and it was more yeah. of a hassle and then they were worried that they weren't actually counting it. So I was like, yeah. I'm just going to keep it, but yeah. I know. I don't trust it. I have to be voting in person. Like that's yeah, just- I just don't, I don't trust it. So I'm like, I just need to go because I really don't think they're, I don't know. I, I don't trust that they're counting all of these in the mail. Absolutely. Um, so what was your first order of business? Um, that you wanted to make happen when you got to Teen Vogue? Um, I think, honestly, I took stock of a lot of the business things. So, like, obviously, you know, where we're spending money and what opportunities there are that I felt like we weren't going after. But I think also looking at the past and seeing things that I really, when I worked there and interned at Teen Vogue that I really wanted to change and how could I make that a better version. So Young Hollywood was one of the first big packages that we did because I was always really excited when I worked at Teen Vogue and, you know, it was like Emma Stone and like all these really big names and Anne Hathaway and all these really big names in Young Hollywood, but it was always really just skinny white cisgender women. Um, and I felt like that was a really cool opportunity for me to bring something back that was really a founding point for the brand, but make it really incredibly inclusive and modern and a lot more fun. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just been a lot of moments like that where, where I really just wanted to kind of take those traditional foundational ideas and make them cool and inclusive of how they should have been all along. Absolutely. And I feel like, I mean, I interned and worked at Teen Vogue as well. Um, and I mean, I understand how packages ended up looking the way that they did for a really long time. But like, what do you think that some of the limiting factors that people might not understand when they like look at how a publication produces content might be? I mean, I think if you don't work in the industry, it's just hard to wrap your head around because you're like, why wouldn't you put this person, this person? But there's so much dictating, you know, who is who and who is for what and I think a big thing for me is always challenging like how we choose who's worthy for opportunities. Who do we, when we say on brand, what does that actually mean? Like everybody likes to say that, but it's like, does that just mean a skinny person or does that mean everyone, you know? And I think a lot of times we use these buzzwords of aesthetic and on brand and, um, you know, they kind of shape and define who gets what opportunities. And I quickly realized that, you know, a lot of the big names or even smaller names, if they had really good PR or they were connected with certain fashion people um, and happened to also be sample size, they would end up in every portfolio and just get a lot of covers because of simple nepotism kind of things. And so for me, it's always actually doing the due diligence and doing the work because I think a lot of times when I look at a lot of portfolios or packages, it's the same names over and over again, um, which is a clear sign that you're just like, oh, this person was in this, so clearly they're good enough. And I think that a lot of my stance has been someone hasn't given this person a cover or an opportunity and they're deserving and I'm going to show you how and why. Um, and it's very common now that a lot of people that I put on covers end up on other people's covers after that because, and I'm usually their first cover and I don't mind it because I know I've always been really good about finding those moments with people and I'm not scared to take a risk on those things. Do you feel like before you had this position, you had people who were championing your ideas and supporting you so that you could take you know you could feel ownership in you know pushing ideas like that forward yeah I mean I think it's always been you know supportive of like you can do it I think that one big thing is like you never realize what they're also doing at the same time to make ends meet so like even when I was you know working at black and on the um uh, what it everywhere nowhere what it's like to be black in fashion piece it wasn't like I had a sabbatical and was working on that um it was like oh no you still need to style shoots and you still need to write for the site daily and you need to interview all these people and transcribe it and write the piece and I think a lot of times we just glamorize when you see something and you're like oh that's amazing but you don't actually know how much schlepping and how much work really went into it and I think that's a really big point, especially for young people, because I feel like they ask me all the time, like, how were you able to do this? And I'm very simply like, I continuously bust my ass even now. Like, I think that there's this misconception that like, once you get the job or you get to a certain level that you're just like sitting back and let me kick my feet up. And it's like, you only continue to elevate and continue to the next level if you're still continuously hustling. Yeah, 
And do you feel like you have enough support to continue the hustle that you're doing now? I do. I mean, honestly, I feel like it is support, but also just like getting a thick skin and understanding that a lot of things are going to take time. I think when we talk about inclusivity and all the changes that, you know, even you and I and Chrissy have talked about, it's like, it can be a little frustrating because you're like, oh, I want all this to change. I want these things to move. Like, Uh and I think the support comes in there because you have people around you to say, look, you're doing the work. It's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight, but Uh you're on the right track. And I think that's really kept me going and, and definitely helps like sustain me. Yeah. Do you consider yourself a patient person? Um, no, not really. (laughs) I I think I'm a really, my number one trait that I really care about is always being kind and empathetic. I think those are really two big things, but I think, um, when you're running a business, it is, yeah, like things need to happen at a certain time. And so I definitely, um, I think I've, I've done a pretty good job of like balancing all the things in this role because I am very creative minded, but also very business oriented. And so when things need to get done, they need to get done. And I'm not like, I do feel like a lot of times, you know, especially in fashion, you can kind of like float and kind of, you know, kind of not really get your deadlines or, you know, turn and copy on time and all those things. And, and I'm definitely about my business for sure. So what positive changes do you think you've witnessed in the past few months in terms of inclusivity and diversity in the fashion space? Yeah, I think the, honestly, the biggest change that I have seen is companies admit their faults, which I know they should have already done. But I think that that really is a big step because I think that a lot of times in the past couple of years, if you Google when a brand did something, they kind of tried to just gaslight people into being like, yeah, that never happened and we're, yeah. we're good and we're moving past it. Mm-hmm. And I think everybody in this moment really wants accountability and transparency, right? And I think that that really starts with being, you know, being honest and calling a spade a spade and saying we didn't get it right. And we're actually doing, you know, integral work both behind the scenes and any public facing things that we're doing as well. And I think that is a really big step for brands because a lot of times they try to just like delete the Instagram posts or like act like things didn't happen. And we really have to move forward in reconciliation as far as that honesty and transparency. Mm -hmm. Do you think that cancel culture is you know, I, do you think it's a real thing? Oh, a hundred percent, a real thing. I don't think it's productive. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's a different thing. I mean, I think there's, there's always power in speaking your truth and standing up for yourself and sharing your own story a hundred percent. But I also, what kind of annoys me Mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways that I'm realizing more and more, especially in this, uh, in the role of like, with Black and Fashion Council is there are a lot of people who really have, I think so much to say on social media, but then cannot actually have the conversation in real life or haven't actually gone, you know, taken the step to actually move things forward. Um, and, And I think there is just a lot of, let me be bold behind a screen, but not actually have the talk with my managers or my HR or let people know like what actually needs to change. Um, And I understand, you know, having to share your story and all those things. But I think one of my biggest things is always like, okay, then what is next? Like, if you share that, then like what action steps, what things are actually going to change, because then you're just venting. Um, And I really want people to get to that point of like, you can share your story, but you also need to be holding these people accountable and accountability really is rooted in like, you want people to be honest and transparent about what they're doing, but also then, you know, allowing there to be a way for people to rise to the occasion of changing and not just being like, well, I'm, I'm done with you and I'm going to act like you don't exist. Mm -hmm. How long do you think you should give people to like, or companies to, you know, make these changes if they're making a very public declaration? Honestly, every company is so different. I will say though, the as long as they are truly, truly committed and you feel that, I think that you will see incremental changes over time. So when companies sign up to work for us, uh, work with us with the Black and Fashion Council, we've given them three years of a, of, a, of a relationship, you know, pledge to sign up for. 
but we honestly did three years because it's more so like we want you to be continuously having this conversation next year and the year after that and the year after that. Mm -hmm. um, some things I can I think can easily be fixed this year at some of these companies which we're working on and then some things I think are going to take a lot more money and a lot more resources and time and that's that's totally fine too. And I think it's understanding the balance between those two of, you know, we want to have this conversation this year, but like, we're still going to be talking about this next year. And I think that is the pressure point because a lot of brands, you know, that may have been canceled, et cetera. It's like, I want them to actually take action <laughs> to, to figure out the ways in which they need to move forward um, and, and continue this so that there is long-term sustainable change. Yeah. I think that a lot of the excitement and enthusiasm that we saw in June is just, I mean, it's already been very clear. It's not sustainable for a lot of yeah. even people like forget companies. Like I see people just being like, Oh, do we still have to talk about this? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, for people who don't know, Lindsay co-founded an organization called the Black and Fashion Council with Sandrine Charles, and it unites fashion companies who want to become more anti-racist with actual plans on how to diversify and things that they need to do and action steps. Um, and so you founded the Black and Fashion Council while having your full-time job as editor-in-chief. Why did you feel like you wanted to do that? And why was it important to you to do? Honestly, I think they, it felt, especially, you know, in talking to Sandrine, we both felt like if we didn't do it, that it would never happen. Mm -hmm. And it is another basically full-time job, a hundred percent, and we're not getting paid. So it, I think a lot of it was like, look, we really actually want things to change and this is going to take a lot of work and we're on the same page about it. So let's just start and do it ourselves and obviously bring a lot of people along with us that want to be part of it. Um, I think, you know, in talking to a lot of the companies, we just really wanted to show people the realization that they can have all these policies about, you know, diversity and inclusivity and resources, et cetera. They can have a certain percentage of people of color or specifically black employees, but like actually putting those policies into practice, actually making people feel included in the workplace is a very different thing. And I think a lot of the companies have just focused on, well, we have a certain amount of percentage of, of black people that work here, or like we have an employee resource group, or we have like the baseline of, you know, people did unconscious bias training six years ago, like whatever it is. And I think that a lot of it is like really challenging these brands to rise to the occasion of changing from the ground up and really systematically of everything that they're doing, everything they're touching, even if it's a small company to a big corporation to make those efforts um, a lot more inclusive and, you know, every little thing honestly could be more inclusive and we've had so many companies say to us you know we're doing these plans and we have all of this like you know what else could we be doing and I think they're always surprised when we come back and give them a long list because I think a lot of people just think baseline we're doing you know making two efforts here and we're, we're done and that's why really things haven't you know systematically changed in the industry. Absolutely and I also think that you know, understanding what it means to be an equitable place is something that, you know, unless you have experience in equity, you probably haven't ever thought about the full spectrum of like what that can mean. Um, I had a beauty event like on Zoom last week and it was like a very small one and um, there were it was me with my hair like this and there was another black girl in a hijab and it was like we're supposed and there was another black girl and we were supposed to be giving ourselves facial massages and then it got to this part where she was like okay now put your hands in your hair and you just pull and you pull and so me and the other girls were, were exactly your face we were like what do we do like and you know the brand was definitely thinking like oh look how good we are we invited all these black women here to like make them feel good and then i'm like this is terrible. terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need to, they need to do over and they need to send you a lot of free products immediately. I, but I think that they genuinely didn't even consider that that might be something that like not everyone can participate in. And yeah. so they don't even understand the experience of now feeling othered when something like that happens. 
Um, and how do you end up coaching people who sign up for the Black and Fashion Council through, you know, awkward things that they might not have even br like brought up themselves or you're, you know, presenting them with things being like, hey, this is a, a blind spot that you're not seeing. Yeah, I mean, I think honestly, the biggest thing for especially white people to realize is that this, you know, I wake up and think about my day and think about the things that I have to do. And racism comes across my mind very quickly. It doesn't take much. <laughs> and I think that white people have just now, a lot of white people I feel like have just now woken up to like, oh my God, this is happening to all these people. This is crazy. Even though this has been happening for centuries. Uh -huh. And I think just understanding, you know, and explaining to these companies that even if they've been trying to do the right thing or haven't been trying to offend anyone, you just joining this moment right now is not enough. Like you just, you know, reading white fragility, not enough. Like you actually are the blessed one in this scenario because you just get to read about racism and close your book and go about your day. Whereas we actually have to experience and live it and feel it and breathe it. And I think um, you need to be people that e even if they don't have bad intentions, that there really is a difference between that experience and just the privilege of being able to learn about it and read about it and not really understand the ways in which that you can be harmful or, you know, uh, you know, say, you know, little microaggressions or things like that. And I think a lot of the conversations with people have been great, but I think a lot of people have been like, oh my gosh, like there's so much work to do. Like what, where do I start? Like, I, I need to read all of these things. And I, I just, it's honestly just like, welcome. Like, I don't know what else to tell you because this is what we've been experiencing for so long. And, you know, you need to be aggressive and really be actively anti-racist. That's really all it is. Yeah. And I think that, you know, because, the other part of that privilege is being able to just opt out completely. Mm -hmm. Being like, oh, this doesn't feel fun. I'm just not going I'm to. Tired. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm tired, you know? Like, it's like, yes, but even that part of it, or, you know, with what I, with Chrissy and I do in our business, like people are like, oh, do we need to like keep posting about this? Like, when can we go back to normal? And it's like, you're never going to be cured from this. It's like, almost like you have to treat it like, you know, an addiction. You have yeah, to, like, no, but it has to be like you have to actively be anti-racist. It's not like you can just be like, well, I'm not, I'm not doing anything that's overtly racist, so I don't need to do anything. It's like, no, I'm pretty sure there are still some behaviors that are not okay, and you need to be actively anti-racist in everything you do. Yeah, I hope that people can really take that message and understand that that is something that we need, not just like for the next 42 days or however long to the election but also next year in the next 10 years in the next generation because that's the other factor of it like you know our parents and our grandparents and our grandparents grandparents have been asking for equality for black people for as long as black people have been around so yeah yeah that's important I mean, people have to be more aggressive with it that's really all it is and i think that if you have people in your circle whether it be friends or family that are, you know, tired of talking about this issue, like you need to check them. You need to really have a conversation with them because I think that people can tire of talking about really important issues and people love to post the Nelson Mandela quotes and, you know, something a little quick on Instagram, but it's like, you need to be living and breathing this movement all day, every day and really care about this as a movement and not just a moment. Mm -hmm. Also because the counterforce is so strong like when we're getting you know news headlines that are like we're gonna have patriotic education and i'm like we barely learn about slavery as it is I so what can be <laughs> <laughs> what can be worse literally you know and i'm like but they're working on it so on our side we need to work on it just as hard 100%. Um, okay well to wrap up i want to get into who you are as a person a little bit more how do you balance Lindsay, the editor-in-chief, the boss, Lindsay, the wife, and the friend? Um, honestly, it's little things that I think to make sure that I'm being present. So I've really enjoyed deleting Instagram on the weekends because mm -hmm. I, 
obviously you have to be on Instagram for work and all those things and I enjoy it, but you, you need a break from it. And I recognize that I just needed a break, mm-hmm. like a, you know, a two day break every week. And so I was like, you know what, I'm not really missing anything on the weekends, mm-hmm. honestly. And I would catch myself you know trying to read a book and then a notification would come up or trying to watch a movie and then I'm not really watching it because I'm scrolling on Instagram on my phone and I just felt like I was you know mindlessly doing things on on Instagram that I did need to be spending my time on and and I think a lot of the shift for me has been making sure that I'm just like enriching my mind and giving myself actual rest because I mean even like sitting in the bed and staring at Instagram or TikTok all night not great for rest, just not. Um, And so I've been, you know, just spending a lot of time, you know, giving myself those little boundaries. Um, I'm a person of faith and I I believe in praying and and meditating and doing anything to really keep your mind mind sound. Mm -hmm. Um, I go to therapy every week. Um, Mm -hmm. It's all the things, honestly, all the things to, to make sure that I'm taking care of myself and that my life feels good to me, which I think is, is important. What are you doing for fun when you're away from Instagram on the weekends? Honestly, a lot of just like stupid onesie things. Like I, my husband has literally killed me and Uno this entire summer. I have not won a round yet. It's actually embarrassing. I'm so bad at Uno, but I've been we've been playing every weekend because I'm really trying to get better. Um, <laughs> like I can't let him win Uno for an entire year. You know, it's like I like his reign has to be out at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of reading, you know, I felt I definitely was one of those people that, especially when I started this job, I started to read less for fun because I would read so much on the site. And, you know, you buy a new book because you saw it come out, whatever, but then you haven't finished the other three books at home. And so actually I'll like set a timer to to read just like out in the stoop by myself. Um, I like to just sit and read the paper. I'll do a bunch of like skincare stuff and a lot of cooking. Oh, wow. What are you cooking these days? I mean, I cook so much stuff. I just enjoy it. I'm not, it's funny because like I went through this phase sharing the cooking stuff and then I stopped because I had a couple people that just annoyed me and they're like, oh, can't believe you're eating this. Or um, one, one woman like reached out and she was like, oh, I know a dietitian, like you shouldn't be eating that. And it just, I don't know, it like set me in a bad mood about it because there's yeah. obviously so much food and fashion that is intertwined. But like, I don't, I don't think about any of those things and it's just not part of who I am. I enjoy eating, I enjoy cooking. Um, I take care of my body. So I, I like to just cook a lot of random things. So like yesterday, I, my big thing was I got a new um, torch. So I made creme brulee. Wow, that's like advanced. <laughs> I can't cook anything. So that's amazing. No, I, I just, I just enjoy it. And I feel like it's a good, like use your hands, mind can be off actually like actually just, you know, relaxing kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's been good. Okay. Well, amazing. Lindsay, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for your time and thank you everyone for tuning in to Revolve You. back.